Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Insight Podcast. My name is Daniel Taher. I am the social media and marketing specialist here at Sentinel Technologies. And today we will be talking about incident response. So top of mind today are first responders and how they've been responding to the pandemic. And actually, Sentinel's first responders are busier than ever. They've been responding to plenty of cyber attack incidents. So here to talk today about market trends and how we are helping customers save their businesses are my two guests. We have Mr. Ted Jobs, our support services manager from the Western region. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And Mr. Bob Kablusik, the chief technology officer here at Sentinel. Welcome back. Yeah, thanks, Dan. So let's dive right in it, gentlemen. What do you have to say about incident response and what can we share with our followers? Sure. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about the Sentinel service offering. So we've got, um, obviously, we have our SOC offering and we have a number of different services that we do there from detection response, um, notification, remediation guidance, including remediation on managed devices. And that's our top growth area. Security is just red hot. You know, it's probably partially due to misfortunes of our customers or maybe they're not our customers yet as well uh you know experiencing a cyber attack uh, but what we've developed over the past few years is a very very strong incident response policy uh, not just policy but actual response team so it's a national team overlaid throughout the nation of experts that are able to come in roll up their sleeves recover your environment you know when one of those unfortunate cyber attacks happens to you so Ted Joffs runs that team. We've got a number of incident response commanders. It's tied very closely to our SOC service where we have our analysts, we have detection tools, we have response tools, and we're even tied into forensics, forensics firms and cyber insurers. So it's been a very active uh, group uh, that is uh, growing pretty rapidly and we're really proud of our capabilities and how many customers we've helped save their businesses and reputations. Excellent. Ted, can you chime in? Yeah, absolutely. Um, our incident response team is, is as Bob was mentioning, national. Um, we do have dedicated commanders as well as dedicated responders. And then we, we obviously overlay that with our technical capabilities uh, throughout Sentinel as a whole. So we have 200 plus additional engineering staff that can be brought in on a moment's notice, depending on what the technology needs require for incident response. And that, that tends to set us apart um, from other incident response companies who are solely dedicated to incident response. Uh, they may not have you know, the full technical capabilities that Sentinel brings to bear there. Excellent. So uh, as we were talking about COVID, those first responders, so Sentinel's team are on it. How can we, uh, wh what's the process they usually go to if an incident were to occur, for example? Uh, if an incident were to occur, um, obviously we hope that the customer uh, gets back to us as quick as possible. We want uh, we want their engagement as fast as possible, mainly because it, when an incident occurs, the faster we can triage that incident, the less impact there's going to be, the less financial cost there's going to be to the customer. So we hope that they contact us, whether it be through their you know their account manager or call into our. our our telephone number for incident response and, and get routed straight to the IR team. Um, we want them to reach out at that point. If they're already a customer of ours, then we just, uh, you know, get them the incident response agreement. We get them to confirm that they're good to go. And our incident commanders step in. We kick out the WebExes. We set up the uh, team spaces, act groups, whatever we need there. And then we get our incident response analysts in and they start digging in. Um, let's try to figure out what it is that we're seeing. Are we seeing right. a business email compromise or a ransomware or you know, phishing attack, whatever it may be. And then from there, once we know what we're dealing with, then we stop the threat and then we move on to remediation and help our customers. One, not just isolate the event and triage, but also restore service overall. Yeah, right now, Daniel, too, I'd add to that, that the, um... You know, th those are reactionary, uh, cus you know, customers or prospects that they have this event, you know, as Ted mentioned, close the window of time that the bad right. actors have to monetize the attack, destroy your infrastructure, breach information from your network, whatever it might be, and let us get to stopping it, figuring out, you know, where did they come in? How did they spread? What was at risk? We do all that. The more proactive approach we have um, is we have a proactive incident response retainer. And this is where we win your policy. Uh, with you, if you don't already have one, we would tune your policy, we would do tabletop exercises. So we will practice a response so that you're organizationally prepared. That really shrinks that window. 
you know, because you're prepared. Normally organizations that are doing that have detection as well. So we work closely with Gartner and uh, we took a look at what they were recommending to customers as far as incident response. And they are suggesting that customers have somebody on retainer for incident response. Cyber insurers are doing the same. Uh, so the ideal scenario is you engage us, we have a prepaid retainer, which gives you benefits as well, some discounted rates, different things, tabletop exercises. So we practice what if, you know, it happens. And I would say almost not if, but when, right? I mean, because cyber incidents are happening all over. The other thing I'd point out is we don't just do it alone. It's not just Sentinel as a team. We've got an awesome team and many of these are done just with Sentinel, but we've partnered with Cisco's incident response. We partner with Silence for their incident compromise assessments. Uh, so we actually have a, a scale out team available as well of vendors and industry leading threat intelligence firms that we can pull together as part of our overall program. Wow. With it being one of our most growing areas, uh, do you see that, you know, more threats are occurring because of what's going on in the world pandemic? Are things more accessible? Or are they just, you know, blindly firing at any? I feel like things used to be a little bit more organized prior to that. Sure. So, uh, sure. And let me uh, let me share a, a slide deck here uh, really quickly. One moment, and we'll uh, we'll do that for you. One thing, Daniel, to mention too is while well, Ted's pulling that up, is we have oh. seen an increase in activity during the uh, COVID and the work from home. Uh, we think most of our customers have as well because getting everybody working and productive from home just on simple things like this WebEx, right? That was a lot of work for a lot of people, but they pushed a lot out and they lowered their defenses very quickly. So we've seen some pretty serious attacks happen from the remote worker. And we do offer pen testing, remote worker pen testing. I'll tell you what your, call it your security blast zone is and what your risk level is. But a lot of people now are hardening those endpoints from a work from home perspective. Uh, but during this period, we definitely saw um, increased number of concurrent incident response activities as people sent people home without really being as prepared from a cybersecurity and governance perspective uh, to do so. Yeah, that's 100 uh, percent accurate. And I would say that the incident responses during COVID were particularly uh, tied to uh, RDP compromises. So remote desktop, remote access uh, solution compromises, as well as uh, related to business email compromise. So and that's that's what I want to share here. Yep. So uh, a couple of things that we see um, coming out of COVID is that, you know, the majority of our incident responses during COVID were related to remote desktop services, um, so remote access solutions, and then also around business email compromise. And this slide, I'm, I'm gonna take you back into 2019 a little bit and show you that you know, 52% of the compromises in 2019 that we saw uh, were targeting ransomware um, with email abuse being closer to 24% in as we've rolled through um, into 2020, we're actually seeing closer to 35% of our, our ransom or of our attacks that we're responding to being email abuse or business email compromise. Yeah. Um, and then ransomware and malware type solutions are dropping right now um, from a compromise perspective. So we're seeing definitely an uptick in those remote access and, and business email compromises. Um, and Ted, some of the compromises are are combined too, aren't they? Where maybe they breach via email abuse, you know, they essentially attack the end user with a successful phishing campaign. And then don't they sort of weaponize some of the some of the attack from that point forward, maybe use some ransomware or use other things to maybe not ransomware, but use other utilities to spread laterally or east west throughout the network? Correct. There is a, a large use of lateral uh, movement there. Um, obviously, one of the things that we track here, and, and these statistics are based on the initial um, the initial threat vector that we've identified, right? And it's true to say that most ransomware does come in through uh, email or a phishing type of attack. Um, so it, those numbers may be skewed a little bit, but the reality is is that email abuse, business email compromise is, is one of the largest threat vectors that you have out there. And with us moving to a remote type workforce, that's going to become even larger as people are using, you know, uh, less standard compliance systems, maybe working from home off of home systems or relying on their phones more. Uh, there's more potential for compromise there um, via email. So it, it's definitely a larger threat vector where, you know, 
people come in, they weaponize an email or they send someone to a link that allows them to download a weaponized content. At that point, once they're in the environment, they kind of pretty much can move laterally in the environment and own pretty much any aspect of the environment. So it is definitely a, a very important thing to protect your email email systems. Yes, it is. Hey, Ted, not to put you on the spot, but maybe I will a little bit real quick. Here. <laughs> um, can you tell us a story? Obviously, we can't use names or anything, you know, keep it keep it anonymous. But do, do you have any uh, stories of where you've seen this this happen recently? You know, and kind of kind of what happened? What was the state of the business at the time? You know, organized chaos probably, you know, ensues as soon as they realize they've been breached. But I, I know that you've told me, so, you know, so many stories. You know, is there is there one that jumps out as a real example? Yeah, there's absolutely. Um, we we had one customer. Um, they were compromised via email, um, and one of the ways that they did that was they got in, they accessed the email system, and they were able to forward um, users' email out to themselves without the user even knowing about it. Um, so they wow. they received a copy of every email that these users sent, and then based on having access to the environment, they were to actually able to forward additional emails for other users, specifically in accounting and payroll. Um, from there, they attempted to actually have money transferred out um, through banking by sending emails that were spe specifically crafted to mimic what has been sent back and forth. So they analyze the email and then mimic it to send you know, money out. Um, one of the things that came from that was that you know, once they were compromised, um, that actor was then able to try to cover their tracks by trying to deploy malware. Um, fortunately, in that particular case, um, the, the malware that was deployed was actually stopped mid-transit, so we were able to catch it mid-transit. So they weren't actually able to deploy the ransomware, but we do have copies of the code that were actually downloaded to their ESXi hosts, which would have been used to encrypt the systems and cover their tracks. Um, so it's it's very important, like I mentioned before, to act fast. Um, because they acted fast and noticed this trend, um, we were able to actually save the systems from being compromised via ransomware. And instead, it was only an email uh, compromise. Yeah, and not just the systems, the company's reputation too. Absolutely. Oh, definitely. Hey, Ted, from an incident response perspective, you know, what would you say are some of the top ways that uh, people could avoid needing us and needing that service from us? Um, truly, 90, about 99%, 98, 99% of the incident responses that we've seen this year um, could have been prevented um, ultimately by using end user knowledge training, right? Um, there's all kinds of different programs out there that you can utilize where you can send uh, emails to users to test them and, and see what their response is, as well as educate them on how to properly be safe in a cybersecurity world. Um, as well as multi-factor authentication. Um, multi-factor authentication would have been probably, besides end user training, the second largest uh, way to impact and prevent uh, ransomware type attacks. Um, and then also within O365, multi-factor authentication could have prevented almost every email compromise attack that we've seen. Yeah, that's good. I think that's good advice. And the good news is I have a lot of customers asking us for securing remote access, tying in things like Cisco ICE with posturing, um, and then looking at like Duo or Microsoft's MFA. Uh, that has been one of our top requests over about the past quarter. Uh, so the good news is people are, are aware. I think that they're they're uh, learning from these events. We're out preaching it for sure. I know that you know Duo comes up a lot. You know whenever we have an incident response, uh, so that's a good thing. If anybody has any questions, wants to learn more about those things as well, feel free to reach out. There you go. Yeah, and and also um, you know there's there's several free things that people can do. You know our, our customers could take advantage of Microsoft Labs, right? It's the local admin password manager uh, service. It's a free solution for Microsoft. It can be deployed real easy, real quick. Um, and it basically rotates the administrative password on, on systems so that the chance of an actor moving laterally in the environment is lessened, um, gives you a, a longer opportunity to remediate versus, you know, having the actor actually be able to cripple and compromise. Yeah, and I've noticed that in the post incident responses, you know, requests for uh, lapse help has come up quite a bit. 
Um, and then the no before from an end user training perspective, we do a managed uh, no before offering and, and that's been pretty commonly asked for as well. So those are good. Those are good things to take a look at right away. Do it ahead of time if you can before Absolutely. you have a breach. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining me today, educating our guests a little bit more about incident response and how Sentinel handles the process. As always, we'd like to thank you for watching the Inside Podcast, and we hope to see you on the next episode. Thank you, gentlemen. No problem. Thank you. Thank you.